Good morning, you all. Uh, I am just going through my tech checks, just making sure that I am streaming. Uh, yes, live to Facebook and YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. Anyone out there can give me a shout. Tell me I'm live on YouTube. That would really help. This is one of the uh, one of the problems with trying to do all of this myself, trying to uh, both do all the tech and be answering questions at the same time. I am live now. Absolutely sensational. Uh, right. A massive hello to you all. Oh, wow. I've got, got shouts coming in from Australia already. Hello. Uh, Evan, I think that says. Uh, thank you so much for getting in touch. Um, right. Yes. So today, my live Q&A, um, I hope you're not getting sick of them, by the way, is all about biodiversity. And drum roll. Drrr, today, uh, it is brought to you by Yo Valley. Yes, that's right. I do have a, a sponsor for this live Q&A, which is amazing news. So a massive shout out to all my new friends at Yo Valley. Uh, their organic farming uh, is a massive contributor to uh, thriving with wildlife and helping to support biodiversity. A great contribution to a healthier planet. Right, okay, so I'm going to be taking all your questions uh, about biodiversity today, having a big chat about uh, what surely is one of the the greatest uh, concerns and interests for anyone who has uh, an interest in, uh, in conservation and biology. Uh, and I've already got a whole bunch which are absolutely screaming in, uh, which is great news. But first of all, let, let me start off with a little bit of um, a definition of what biodiversity is. So... Biodiversity, biodiversity is essentially variance and variety in the natural world. And that can be at a, an ecosystem level, at a habitat level. It can be at a species level or it can be at a, at a genetic level. And biodiversity is one of the, the key features that help any environment function. Uh, so there are an estimated uh, 8 million uh, species that are, are, no, so I think about 1.5 million species have been described on the planet now. Um, there are anything from 8 to several hundred million species out there. Uh, the vast majority of those are, are invertebrates and very little things. And they each have a, a complicated role to play in the way that environments function. Uh, so, listen, I've already got hundreds of questions screaming in, which is absolutely amazing. So, so let me get started on some of your questions. Uh, Dear Mummy Blog, how can I encourage more wildlife into my garden like butterflies and dragonflies from Bella, aged seven? Um, so one of the first things I should say is that uh, my connection to Yo Valley uh, has also uh, involved me making a whole bunch of short videos about exactly this, about how you can encourage biodiversity into your gardens and if you haven't got gardens into your into your nest boxes or into your uh, into your uh, window boxes so uh, look out for those those will be out very soon both on their channels and on mine encouraging more wildlife into your garden it, it, it's a big question but one of the best things you can do is is sort of what you can see around me right now it's having a bit of your garden that you don't garden where you don't do any gardening, where you just let everything run completely riot. Um, so behind me, I've got shed loads of, of nettles and brambles and all the kind of things that most gardeners absolutely hate. Well, well, nettles are one of the fundamental food plants for the caterpillars of you know a huge amount of the butterflies that we love seeing around us in the summer. So if you have a little patch of your garden that you don't do too much to, that can have a huge role in encouraging uh, bugs in your garden. If you get bugs, you might be able to hear there's a, a, a robin singing above me right now. Uh, and the robins are coming in and collecting those caterpillars to take back to their youngsters. So having a wild corner of your garden can have a knock-on effect, a bounce-on effect uh, throughout uh, the little ecosystem that is your backyard. Uh, right, let's move on to my, my next question. I've got some absolute corkers coming in here. Um, Madeline, to what extent have anthropogenic impacts on the environment, i.e. deforestation and urbanisation, had a large-scale effect on biodiversity? This is my dissertation topic, and it would be a dream to get a quote from you. Madeline, essentially, you're asking me to do your homework for you, aren't you? Uh, which is fair enough. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing question. It's... Um, so uh, most modern ecologists 
describe the epoch that we are living through now as the Anthropocene. So, you know, anyone who's studied the past and studied dinosaurs will have studied uh, the Triassic and Cretaceous and Jurassic periods. Well, right now we are living in the Anthropocene, that is the, the generation that is dominated by us as a species, by human beings. And we are doing more to change and to impact our planet than any other single species has done in the history of, of life on Earth. You know, our, our planet's been around for probably 4.5, 4 billion years and no single species has ever had the kind of impact that we are having right now. And that's that's something that I personally have seen throughout my, my career. So I've been uh, making wildlife television programs for over 20 years now. And I have seen places change. Places that I first went to when I started out working in television are unrecognisable now. And a huge amount of that it results in a, a massive de decrease in biodiversity classic example would be um, in Borneo. So I first went to Borneo in 1990 and I can remember flying over this extraordinary jungle island and just seeing below me nothing but forest. Jungle stretching off as far as the eye could see in, in every single direction. And when you got down into that jungle, it was alive. At night it was deafening with the sounds of, of bugs and frogs and cicadas and birds. Now, uh, if you go back to Borneo, uh, you can fly over that vast, what once was jungle island, and all you see below you is oil palm, stretching as far as the eye can see in every single dire direction, the ultimate monoculture. And when you get down into the oil palm plantations, it is silent. There is nothing living there apart from rats and cockroaches. Uh, so I am seeing that huge decrease in biodiversity because of uh, anthropogenic uh, action during my lifetime. In the time that I have been alive, and I'm, I'm not that old, despite uh, despite what my face might, might say, we have lost half of the world's wild animals. Uh, and that is just utterly heartbreaking. The extinctions are happening faster now than they, they were at the KT boundary. It's not called KT boundary anymore, is it? But but at the at the end of the Cretaceous, when you know the giant asteroid struck the, struck the planet, resulting in the uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs, we are losing species at a faster rate now due to our effects as human beings, and that is why we all need to become champions for biodiversity. And and what we do on our own patch is important. I'm sure I'll come on to that a little bit more later on. Madeline, thank you very much. I'm sorry that's a little bit too much for a for a quote for your dissertation, but I hope that that helps. Um, <clears throat> Tom Williams, with global pollution levels decreasing due to the lockdown, do you believe many countries will see this as a sign to change their ways in order to reduce future greenhouse gas emissions? <sighs> wow. Um, so I think we are we are all seeing if, if there are any positives to come out of this this period of lockdown, we probably have have tasted the potential of what could happen if we were to reduce our, our emissions, if we were to reduce our travel. You know, the air quality has dramatically improved. I'm sure, you know, everyone has seen images of uh, looking north from the, the big cities in India and actually being able to see the Himalayas for the first time in, in living memory. Um, my fear is that with any situation like this where, where people's bank balances are, are challenged, altruism is something that tends to slip down the scale of importance and that uh, actually once once lockdown is, is over, we are going to be in a desperate rush to rebuild economies, to um, get back to where we were before instead of finding, you know, everyone's talking about the new normal right now this kind of you know buzz phrase I'm not really sure what that means but I do know that this could be a time for for starting again for figuring out what's important and for trying to find a, a different way of, of running our societies which could be far far more effective and and have a, a much better long-term solution particularly in terms of climate change my theory is that we will do exactly the opposite uh, Mitch, what effect will climate change have on biodiversity? Uh, so that, I, I guess, leads on to from the last question. So um, 
the effects on biodiversity are huge because climate change itself is so complex and it has effects in every single ecosystem, whether that is uh, marine ecosystems and coral reefs uh, that are, are being destroyed by ocean acidification and by runoffs and, and by coral bleaching, uh, or whether it's Arctic tundra and massive releases of, of methane and feedback effects that are caused by that. Um, to give you an idea, working in the Arctic, um, it has been noted that mountain goats that in the summer will take themselves to the very highest possible peaks to escape the attentions of parasitic biting flies are having massive reduction now with climate change in their breeding success because uh, in the summer now they are taking themselves to the highest mountaintops to escape those biting flies but because it's a couple of degrees warmer, those biting flies are still there. So instead, instead of um, instead of breeding, they're just wandering around in circles, desperately trying to escape the flies. Their breeding success has decreased. Who would ever have thought that something like that would be a bounce on effect from climate change? The fact is, um, it is going to have massive, far-reaching effects through all of our environments. And you know, it's possible that some species will will do better, but the majority won't. Um, Megan, uh, 17, do you believe a certain animal has the most important role on the planet? Uh, so I, I presume you're asking about, about biodiversity and, uh, it would be very hard not to, to respond with the hymenoptera, the bees, the wasps and the ants. Um, I mean, bugs in general, you know, I'm, I've, I've been working with bug life, uh, for, for the last lots of years. Uh, wonderful charity, all about the, the little things that rule the world. Um, and invertebrates as a whole are, are far more important to our ecosystems than we as human beings are. Um, but I would say particularly uh, bees, wasps and ants, they, they regulate our ecosystems fundamentally. And a big part of maintaining a good wildlife garden or of organic farming is making sure that you have a place for those for those insects um at, you know and i'm not just talking about honeybees there's there's 180,000 different kinds at least of of hymenoptera uh so many of our plants so much of our farming relies uh on those on those pollinators and on you know people always say what's the point of wasps what is the point of wasps well wasps are, are, are predatory and they predominantly you know they're not just there to spoil our picnics wasps are predators that feed on a lot of the, the the things like like aphids that would otherwise destroy a huge amount of the the food that we rely on so they're they're vital uh, so yes i would say that the um the most important animals are the, the hymenoptera the bees wasps and ants uh too slow says um how are bees doing now in the uk i'm not sure if too slow is is your name or if it's um or if it's some kind of heckle on my uh, on my Q&A. Either way, how are bees doing in the UK? So uh, I was just talking about bug life. Bug life are at present running a campaign called No I Insect Inction, No Insect Inction, uh, which is is all about addressing uh, the the scenario that we have at present with uh, the possible collapse of uh, a bug colonies, like you know colony collapse disorder being the absolute classic. Uh, recent research by Bug Life and by uh, WWF has shown that in the part of the country where I live, uh, bees are, are massively under threat. We have lost uh, 17 species, they're extinct completely, 25 are threatened, and a further 31 are of conservation concern. That's just, just where I live. So um, anything that we can do, um, on our local patch is important. Uh, Colin McCallum says, we would love to see you back on the judo mat. Uh, I'm not sure which, which judo dojo you're at, Colin, um, but look at the state of me. I'm not going back to judo anytime soon. I'd be absolutely destroyed. <laughs> uh, Oliver Matthew Harris from Crook uh, County Durham asks if I've ever uh, tracked polar bears. Absolutely, yes. Uh, they are the most awesome uh, creatures to, to track out in the uh, wild. Um, Harrison, five, Staffordshire. Do hover flies fly? Of course they do. That's why they're called a fly, surely. 
Um, so we've got Austin, who, age nine, from Australia. We have lots of wallabies coming to our garden at night. The grass keeps them well fed, and Dad says we don't have to mow the lawns as much. That is a win-win if ever I heard one. I, I would very, very much like to have wallabies coming into my back garden. That would be absolutely amazing. Um, Cape Bainan, how can we stop global warming? Wow, massive, massive question. Uh, the first thing we can do is make sure that our, our businesses and our, uh, our governments are, are very much on side. So let them know that it's important to you. Um, because you know it's it's down to them to make sure they sign up to all the international protocols to make sure that we can do our very best uh, to to try and at very least offset our emissions. Um, oh, we had a good one there, which I've just was gone flying past. Um, sorry, I'm trying to uh, trying to process these questions at the same time as uh, as answering. Uh, it's a shame that was a really good one. Um, what else have I got? <laughs> Hi Steve, how can I stop cats getting into my hedgehog feeding station made with bricks? The cat keeps coming and pinching it. Um, yeah, that's a tricky one. You know, I, I, um, I am old enough to remember when we used to put out bread and milk for hedgehogs in our gardens. Uh, and to anyone watching, do not do that, whatever you do. It's really bad for their tummies. Um, now, the advice is, is usually to put out cat food because that's exactly what they, uh, they they seem to like but obviously then you're gonna have problems with with your cat um, what I have done is I have my my hedgehog homes which is where my, my hedgehogs uh, will nest during the summer and use as a hibernacular at night um, I have an extra sort of tunnel on the end of it which is too small for cats to get into and that's not just for them uh, pinching the food it's more for them uh, going in and potentially preying on the hedgehogs themselves I, I have um, actually broken apart a uh, a cat and a hedgehog that were on my lawn with a cat trying to flip the hedgehog over to get to its its underside uh, which was an amazing thing to see you wouldn't think that a cat would feed on a hedgehog but given a chance they uh, they will charlie's asked what's the most devastating place that you've been to um i i think actually probably borneo that i talked about just before because i been back so many times through the process so first there in, in 1990 uh, and over that 30 years I, I've seen it change and change dramatically so that now all that remain these little patches of, uh, of forest. Georgina Scott Beatty what is the most endangered species in your opinion from from Izzy? Hello Izzy how are you doing? Um, oh, I, unfortunately there are an awful lot to choose from um, some of those which which kind of I guess are of greatest concern the vaquita would certainly be up there uh, look it up it's an impossibly cute porpoise the smallest cetacean uh, on the planet and there are there are just a couple of dozen left out there uh, Dan in Solihull nine today hello Dan how are you really nice to uh, to hear from you um ah here's a good one Drakowson why does the blue tit in my garden keep knocking on my birdhouse do you know when I was a, a, a youngster I used to have a blue tit that came to my window and tapped on the window all the time. And I, I, I've never got a hundred percent good reason as to why it is. The best that I've heard is um, that they could be being slightly territorial and that potentially they see themselves and their reflection in the, in the mirror and think that, um, that, that, that it's another, another blue tit. Um, Someone asking, what is the most effective country in the world uh, for pollution? Um, I, I think, you know, New Zealand ha have an incredible uh, record for their uh, for their ecology. Um, also, uh, Costa Rica as well. Um, but, um, yeah, there, unfortunately, there are a lot more. The list of countries that are not doing so well is, uh, is much, much longer. Um, so... The Squiffy Mill, we're very sad here about the effects of HS2 and local ancient woodland being destroyed. My son Alfie and daughter Rosie would love to know how they can practically help those animals that have lost their homes. We're going to rewild part of our garden. Any suggestions? Um, Alfie and Rosie, that is brilliant. Thank you so, so much for your, uh, for your thoughts and for your, for your help. Um, look out for the, uh, these videos that I'm doing with Yo Valley. They'll be out uh, 
within the next week or so and on their social media sites i'll probably put them up on my youtube channel as well youtube channel as well uh, which will be talking about things that you can do practically in your garden uh, to try and create a wild space and build a bug hotel a wildlife pond and all these kind of things that we can all do uh, to make our own um, our own space more wildlife friendly um hs2 well i could do it i could do a whole um chat just on that but uh, let's let's not get sidetracked into that for the moment because because uh, yeah we'll, we'll have a very very long conversation zoe savage i get a lot of bugs and insects around here oh great uh, what are the best flowers to plant for bees and butterflies at this time of year um so uh, there are the, the it's twofold so there is both the uh, the things that you can put on for, uh, for for caterpillars so you know stuff like like nettles and other uh, wild plants are, are fantastic for that and then nectar rich flowers which um you're going to be looking at for your for your bees and butterflies uh, the classic obviously is is buddleia but uh, i made the mistake of planting a buddleia bush in my back garden and it pretty much grew over the entire back garden it grows at an absolutely crazy rate um Bug Life's website has a, a, a massive, great long list of the best nectar-rich uh, flowers to plant at particular times of year. Um, obviously, now in spring, you know you, you, you're not at the ideal time to be planting stuff, but um, but summer and late summer blooming uh, flowers uh, can still have a really good effect, even if they're planted now. Uh, Is he always busy? What what great name? Uh, would you say that global terrestrial or marine biodiversity is more under threat from climate change? Uh, it, it's kind of impossible to tell because because it's so complex and because there are so many potential knock-on effects in so many uh, different ways. Um, certainly, at present, our, uh, our our tropical marine habitats are right on a knife edge uh, and that is that is really really frightening but then there are lots of terrestrial ecosystems that are changing i mean arctic eco ecosystems are, are changing at a rate of knots faster than than anywhere else and, and certainly give me a, a, a huge amount of concern um questions flying through here this is absolutely brilliant stuff um we have abraham who is asking why is plastic so bad for our world um so fundamental plastic Plastic is an incredible substance. Plastic is something which, uh, you know, I, I know our National Health Service at the moment could not do without. It's not plastic itself that is the problem. It's how we use plastic, how we think about plastic, and critically how we dispose of plastic. Um, our single-use plastic mentality has to change. So just think about the insanity of having a plastic bottle that can, contains a drink that you could consume in a minute and the bottle itself will then last for a hundred years just doesn't make any sense uh, we need to rethink the way that we the way that we function we have to get away from this disposable lifestyle that we have where we create too much waste um, and where we we are basically just you know filling up landfill filling up our oceans filling up our waterways with with plastic that just you know doesn't degrade and when it does degrade breaks down into micro beads and microfibers that are, are, are appalling for our environments uh, so vicky thompson can you help raising the support needed by wildlife charities by government they have their uh, oh, flicked past i think you were saying that they have uh, their income reduced by 50 percent i i Honestly, I'm doing my best. I'm, I'm doing as many shout outs as I can. I'm trying to, to connect people and trying to, to fundraise for as many wildlife charities as possible. You are absolutely spot on. You know, it's not just us that, that is suffering during these uh, lockdown times. Wildlife charities are really, really struggling. So anything you can do uh, for your local wildlife refuge or for the wildlife uh, organization that you have the most uh, connection to, please, please get stuck in because they need your help. Um, oh, sorry. You were, you weren't saying fly you were saying the hoverflies sting uh, no they don't they have a, a long extended proboscis which um, has the same function as a, a butterfly's uh, curled up proboscis for feeding on nectar but no they they don't uh, they don't bite or sting um this is great loads and loads of stuff uh, coming in here um matt smith what's the most polluted sea um don't quote me on this. I'm not sure if it's the most polluted, but there was a point in time 
where cetaceans from the Gulf of Lawrence, if they were washed ashore, were considered biohazard because the the, the sea itself was so polluted. I, I think now it must be better because um, I, I have friends who've been filming uh, Greenland sharks and things there and, and uh, have been diving there. Um, Kerry, oh, from Bendigo in in Australia. How it's not Bendigo, is it? It's Bendigo. Sorry, <laughs> I've made that mistake too many times in the past. Um, I'm very much hoping to be back in in Bendigo and, and with all my friends in Australia in January of next year on tour. Uh, just fingers crossed, I will be allowed uh, to to go back there. And your question has zipped past, and I have no idea how to get back to it. I'm sorry, but a massive, massive hello to you. Um, why do leatherback turtles have so many teeth from Jake? Um, leatherback turtles don't have teeth uh, per se. So they have uh, that, that classic turtle-like uh, jaw that doesn't have any teeth inside it. What they have are these backwards pointing spines in their throats. And that's because they predominantly feed on jellyfish and jellyfish could wash in and then wash straight back out again. And it kind of makes sure that they're restrained in their throats and can be uh, washed down into their uh, into their, their gullet. Um, Unfortunately, that has led to a lot of leatherback turtles suffering because they've they've mistaken plastic bags uh, in the water column for for jellyfish. It gets washed in, it gets held back by those spines, uh, and that has led to asphyxiation asphyxiation of um, of leatherback turtles. Lisa Taylor, what country do scorpion flies come from? We have them right here in the UK. Um, what else have we got here? Um, Lewis Hedden. Uh, says he just finished his first year of marine and freshwater conservation degree. Uh, well done, Lewis. What advice would you give to an aspiring conservationist? And uh, Twin Tasha says pretty much the same thing. Uh, what's the best way an aspiring naturalist and passionate environmentalist can introduce more biodiversity to local, urban and rural areas? Uh, that's Natasha, she's 19, and she is a lifelong factual fan. Well, a massive shout out to you, Natasha. Um, so, Lewis, you're already doing it. You are you are well on your way. Um the advice I would give to an aspiring conservationist, I kind of almost feel like my advice now is redundant to people of your generation. I think that uh, people of your age and of Tasha's age are, are doing more and finding better new ways of uh, addressing the problems of our planet than my generation ever have. Um, you are so far ahead when it comes to the use of, of social media when it comes to the use of new media, um, and it, it is inspiring to watch. I've said this many times before, uh, it's turning into a mantra for me, but I think that this time in our history will be looked back on alongside the great civil rights movements of the past, and it will be, be because of people like you, young people who have taken on the planet's problems, made them their own, and just kind of refused to to kowtow to to big power. Um, Lewis Boutinot, uh, I hope I've said that right. As consumers would consume organic, ah, as sorry, as consumers would consuming organic food drinks rather than conventionally farmed food drinks help promote, protect, and improve biodiversity in the environment. Have you explored the way biodynamic food and drink production goes even further towards these ends? Um, I don't know an awful lot about biodynamic. I mean, from memory, that is, um, that's kind of just like a more holistic form of organic farming. Is that right? Uh, where essentially an organic farm is, is seen as, as being uh, like a, a holistic whole, everything feeding back into itself. And that kind of is what organic farming is anyway. Um, so yes, to answer your question, as a consumer, uh, focusing on organic food is is hugely important um monoculture which is the the more con conventional form of farming can be hugely destructive and uh, organic farms by by using less gm by uh, using less uh, less coloring less additives uh, by using fewer uh, insecticides that's absolutely crucial um have a massive role to play but also um in so Yo Valley that I'm working with uh, on this particular um, this particular whatever this is uh, Q and A um, and organic farms like them have hedgerows absolutely critical wildlife areas that are set aside for wildlife that might be farmlands it might be um, it might be meadows flower rich meadows um, and all that that 
does is it, it doesn't allow the landscape to become fragmented. So working with um, with Bug Life, which is one of my one of my charities, uh, bee lines are one of their their buzzwords, buzzwords. Um, and essentially, what those are are ways that we can link up wild habitats so that they don't get spread out and um, and fragmented. And and those can be your back gardens, or they can be organic farms that have hedgerows that are full of life, where there are robins. Um, having their nests where there are endless amounts of invertebrates and all of a sudden an organic farm that could be uh, sorry a, a farm that if it was monoculture could effectively be a wasteland for wildlife can become a thriving hub a haven for wildlife so by making those choices ourselves as consumers by by focusing on organic food yes we, we have a big role to play but also, I think, in, in maintaining biodiversity in our back gardens as well. Um, what else have we got? Uh, loads and loads of uh, questions coming in here. Uh, what is the most biodiverse country in the world? Um, I know that Costa Rica usually sells itself as being the most biodiverse country in the world. I'm not sure if that's just um, that they have an astute tourist board, and that's a good uh, good buzzword. Certainly, it is at that connection point between um, North America and South America, and that that. Uh, that thin, narrow strip of land that runs between the two with Panama, Nicaragua, Honduras and uh, Costa Rica, Belize, um, where there is an extraordinarily high level of biodiversity. You've got the the, the um, essentially flora and fauna of two uh, continents coming together in this one place. OK, we are we are at half an hour. I'm going to get a few more um, a few more minutes, if that's all right for you all. Um, what else have we got coming in? So many questions. This is absolutely brilliant. Uh, Evie from Bristol would like to know if hoverflies are bees or flies. They're flies. I, do you know what? I've been getting an awful lot of questions, more than I have ever had before, on hoverflies this spring. Um, I, I wonder if it's been a really good year for hoverflies, because I've, I've certainly seen an awful lot of them as well. Um, so maybe. Maybe the fact that I'm getting all these questions in just means that we are seeing more of them now. Let's fingers crossed that it has been a very good year for them. Katie Miller saying, the video, it's great. Thank you very much, Katie. That's really uh, kind of you. Sarah Delaney asking, what are the Badgers names? Um, I'll leave that till Wednesday, till my live Q&A on, uh, on Wednesday to uh, to reveal what it's going to be. Um, Jennifer Goldie, what animal has the shortest lifespan? Um, I think uh, obviously the, the mayfly, the ephemeroptera, ephemeral living uh, insects that um, as adults may leave no, no more than a few hours but obviously as uh, as aquatic larvae live for an awful lot longer than that help me joe bryan says ideas for keeping teenagers interested in wildlife uh, keeping teenagers interested in wildlife well hopefully uh, some of the videos that i've got coming out will, will give you some ideas for things that you can do in your own back garden heather hutchins i love you so that's very very kind of you heather um oliver if you could bring back one uk animal from extinction what would it be oh great question so um obviously we we lost our wolves around about the time of henry the eighth the wolves are my my favorite animal in the world uh, whether they would work here as a, a reintroduction is a, a topic that i could do a whole one of these q and a's on um but if we forget the practicalities and we just think about from the heart uh, it would be it would be wolves. Um, we've got hello from Oscar, age seven in Cornwall, a huge shark fan. Hello, Oscar. I'm a big uh, shark fan, too. Uh, we have someone there. Oscar, I think it was. Was that Oscar or Oliver asking why do snakes have venom? Uh, venom is something that can be used for defense, but also it can be used to effectively take down its prey. It is a developed saliva and also can help in um, in, in digestion of their food as well. Um this is absolutely brilliant. I've got so many questions come through. This is amazing. Um, Nicola McKenzie, how do you think we can support the changes we're seeing in the environment since entering lockdown as we emerge from it? What an amazing question. Um, OK, it's huge. I could be talking about this for hours, so let me focus on one tiny thing. In my back garden, I live on the River Thames. Uh, this has been the best year ever for nesting birds because all the birds that nest down at, at water level have a huge amount of mortality from, um, from boats, from boat traffic. Uh, I would like to see the fact that we have no boat traffic now. 
and the birds have been succeeding because of it. Let's slow down the boat traffic on our rivers. I think it'd have a massive, massive, um, massive impact. Uh, Marlon from 13 in Byron Bay wants a shout out. Hello, uh, Marlon, how are you? Uh, really good to hear from you. Uh, we have a, a video of a hummingbird moth in your garden now already, really? Um, Liam and Oliver, who are 10 and 8 from Rigby. Um, Got to say, that's quite, that is early. That's really early, but wonderful. Uh, I'm assuming that you're very far south in the UK. What a fabulous moth that is. That is just uh, amazing to hear. And Natalie Barnes, hello from Melbourne in Australia. Hello, you all. Um, Daisy, why can we see little owls uh, around our house? Because you are incredibly lucky. Uh, really, really good news to me. We have little owls here. Um, I, I live um, on a um, on, on the land of a farm as well. Hello to James and Tina, if you're watching my uh, my landlords, as it were. And we do have little owls here, but. Uh, I've never seen them, although I have got a whole bunch of their pellets. Right, we are now at uh, five minutes over our limit. So despite the fact that I've got all of these amazing questions coming in, um, I am going to uh, sign off. I don't know if any of you have noticed, but I'm sat here in my, my T-shirt um, and it's way colder than I imagined it was. And I'm actually shivering. Um, so I'll be quite glad to uh, to bring this Q&A to an end. Uh, but look out for my next Q&A, which will be 9.30 on Wednesday morning. Uh, give me a shout out for what you would like the theme to be for that Q&A, because I haven't got a theme for that yet. I will be revealing the, uh, the names of our Badger Cubs and bringing you lots more from the wonderful world of our of our badges. Um, what else do I have to say? Yes, uh, look out for the videos I'll be doing with uh, Yo Valley, which will be coming out within the next week or so on their social media channels and I hope on my YouTube channel as well. And a huge thank you uh, to all my new friends at Yo Valley for uh, supporting this Q&A. Um, and uh, yes, thank you all very, very much for all your questions about biodiversity. I hope I've answered some of those. If I don't, uh, then try and get in your questions for my next Q&A on Wednesday. And all the very best from me, Stevie B.